Thanks, John. Well, our gospel lesson today is found in the fifth chapter of Matthew. It's the 13th through 20th verses. Jesus is preaching on the side of the hillside. Some people call it the Sermon on the Mount, but this is, this is part of it. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of the hill cannot be hidden. Neither, can, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. Don't even begin to think that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest, low, lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me now? Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Salt is basic. If you go to anybody's dining room table, the chances are there's a salt shaker there. Right? And how many times have we all or even said ourselves the expression... They are the salt of the earth. When we say that, do we, what do we normally mean? What do, we, what do we mean? They're good. It means that the particular people we are speaking of are solid, loyal, trustworthy, hardworking, God-fearing people. Salt, as a biblical term, is something that we all understand. We know what it does and how it works. It simply sits around in its little blue box on the shelf in the kitchen until the time that we need to add some flavor to our food. It isn't something exotic like frankincense or myrrh. When was the last time you heard at the dinner table, hey honey, would you please pass the myrrh shaker? Or Martha, this sure could use some frankincense. Salt was regular. It's not fancy. Salt for every day, not just salt for company. If we were to be like salt, it meant that we were to be useful. But salt doesn't work alone. It preserves, it adds flavor, it zests things up. It changes the soil, the water, the function of the human body. For salt to work, it must be used with something. In our gospel lesson from Matthew today, Jesus says in order to be a disciple, you had to be like salt, adding zest and making a difference. Now, a lot has been made about this text from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. His remarks on that hillside are some of the best known words in the entire Bible. And among them, the words of our gospel today are again, some of the best known. Salt is very important in society. It is actually a necessity for life. The human body cannot live without sodium. It's needed to transmit nerve impulses, to contract and relax muscle fibers, including those of the heart and blood vessel. 
and it also helps us maintain a proper fluid balance. Now, in biblical times, salt was even more important. Moving beyond its use as an additive to make dishes taste better, salt was used as a preservative. It was used as a disinfectant, a component of ceremonial offerings, and as a unit of exchange. The Bible contains numerous references to salt. In various contexts, it is used metaphorically to signify permanence, loyalty, durability, fidelity, usefulness, value, and purification. In our lesson today, Jesus uses salt to explain to his disciples their role in ministry. Notice in our text that Jesus is talking in the present tense. As he did in last week in describing the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't say that his disciples will be the salt of the earth. He says they are the salt of the earth. Jesus' teaching is not only about what the kingdom of God is, but truly about who the disciples are and what their new lives with him look like. They are to be tasty, adding flavor to the lives of those they come in contact with. Jesus, however, warns them that in order to be salt, to be effective, it must remain pure. Not tainted, not watered down. If that happens, then it loses its effectiveness. If salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored, Jesus asks. It is no longer good for anything, but is to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Just trash. At this point, Jesus amends the job description of the disciple to not only include being salt, but being light. They are to be a light to the people as well. Now, except in times of bad weather or forgetting to pay our electric bills, everyone gathered here has never had to live without light in their lives. I'm betting. Light provides us vision in the darkness. In some ways, it gives us warmth. Light has been used as a signal to warn others of dangers ahead, like a lighthouse on a distant shore. Amy Oden on WorkingPreacher.com says, Jesus, you remember, is constantly referred to as the light of the world. This text holds Isaiah 49 in the background, that Israel, the people of God, is to be the light of the nations. In short, God's people are called to shine brightly the light of Christ that has been given to us so that the world may see the glory of the one revealed in Jesus. New Testament scholars believe that in speaking of being salt and light, Jesus was actually speaking metaphorically about the Essene sect of Judaism that lived in Qumran along the Dead Sea. This is the community in which they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes were quite familiar with salt. In fact, they made table salt by evaporating the salty waters of the sea. They were indeed a right salty community, author uh, Glenn Stassen says in his book, Living the Sermon on the Mount. They were definitely different from the world and its compromises, he says. The Beatitudes, as we talked about last week, were a description of a way of living that was quite distinct from the normal practices of Judaism in Jesus' day. Jesus called on his disciples to live quite differently in a world in which they were accustomed. But being different is not enough. You are the light of the world, Jesus says. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand so it can give light to all. And that was the problem with the Essenes, Jesus says. While Jesus praises the Essenes for their strict adherence to the Jewish law, he says that they are hiding their light under a bushel where no one can see it. They are living their lives in Qumran, away from the eyes of others. Their good works could not be seen by the world because they remained hidden in their community by the Dead Sea. Jesus' disciples, on the other hand, must not live that way. 
They must be the light shining into the dark places of the world. They must place their lights out in the open on top of the lampstands for everyone to see. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven, Jesus says in verse 16. In Jesus' next statements, it is important for us to understand that it was not ever Jesus' attempt to start a new religion. Contrary to what many believe, Jesus was not a Christian. He was a devout Jew. He practiced what he preached. There is no indication in all of Scripture that he ever strayed away from the kosher dietary laws of the Jews. He wore a prayer shawl when he prayed. He attended temple on the Sabbath. He observed the many Jewish festivals and celebrations. So when he says in verses 17 and 18, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish it, but fulfill it. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. When Jesus said that, he meant it. To clarify Jesus' meaning to you just a little bit, you need to know a little bit about the Greek alphabet. You ready for a lesson? Perhaps you've heard the saying, not one iota. Anybody ever heard that? I don't care, one iota. Iota is the smallest of all the characters in the Greek alphabet. Just as the yod, Y-O-D, which looks like an apostrophe, is in the Hebrew alphabet. That's what Jesus is referring to when he said, not one stroke of the letter of the law would he change. So he wouldn't even change that little apostrophe. Jesus understood that what was attracting many to him was the hope that if he were truly the Messiah, he would change the laws that the people found so impossible to keep. Instead of being like the Essenes and living in strict compliance with Jewish laws, some of his new followers were seeking a path of least resistance as a way to God. But Jesus makes it clear that following him is not a way to avoid or even break the law. Those that attempt to circumvent the law or attempt to teach others how to do it would ultimately lose their place in the kingdom of heaven. They will be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does follow the laws and teaches them will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus reminds us. As if to emphasize the point, Jesus tells his disciples that not only are they to walk the path left, the path left traveled, and to stick to it, but they are to keep the law more seriously and righteously than the leaders of the temple. The ground they cover may be hard for them to travel over, but it is the only way to reach God's kingdom. Then Jesus says in verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. As the Son of God, Jesus understood that the people of Israel had, for far too long, tried to take the path of least resistance to God. Far too long they charted their own course around the obstacles they found in observing God's laws. Oftentimes we too are guilty of charting our own course instead of following the road and the road map that God left for us in the words of this book. Instead of understanding who God really is and trying to live up to the standards that he expects of all of us, we attempt to mold and shape God into an image that suits us. We become self-defining in who we are. We no longer seem happy to have been created in the image of God. It's all too easy for us to attempt to transform Jesus into just another nice preacher who will allow us to live our lives in our own terms. But that's not following anyone. That's charting our own course. The Sermon on the Mount reminds us whether we want to be reminded or not that faith in Jesus requires following him on a specific and narrow path. 
Not the path we would choose, but the path that was chosen for us. He never promised us that this path would be easy to travel. There will be obstacles that we have to overcome, but we have to take on those obstacles head on with God's help. We are called to, be, to, a strict, to a strictly adhere to the law of love that Jesus shares with us every day. It's a high call. If it was easy to reach what God has to offer us, wouldn't it, be, it wouldn't be worth the effort. Let me say that again. If it was easy to reach what God had to offer to us, it wouldn't be worth the effort. Jesus calls for us to make a difference in our world. We are able to be the salt that adds flavor, that preserves the will of God for his people. We are called to be the light of the world, shining into the darkness of despair for so many of our brothers and sisters. Each one of us gathered here today are the spices in an otherwise pretty bland world. We are the light that lights the pathways to justice and mercy found at the foot of the cross. Today, Jesus is not only calling us to be tasty, but to brightly be lit up in order to make a difference for God in this world. Neither salt nor light exists for themselves. Each serves a purpose, and that purpose can only be fulfilled when they are used and poured out. The same can be said for us. We are not to let our saltiness just sit there and become useless and watered down and thrown out with the trash. We are not to hide our light under a bushel and to remain hidden within the walls of a church or a sanctuary or even our own homes. These gifts of God are to be used and poured out for all to use. If we are looking for a purpose in our lives, perhaps we should consider spreading a little bit of our flavor to the world and its needs. Perhaps we should move, remove the lampstands that hide the light from this world and dare to shine it into the dark places that seem to be growing darker by the moment. It takes boldness to do so. But that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Jesus is calling all of us, brothers and sisters. And his words are simple. Be salt. Be light. Amen. And now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.